today we are going to have a, another interesting uh, monthly clinical meeting. Actually, it's not monthly. Now we are having uh, last one or two months uh, weekly clinical meetings because the initial half of the year we have given priority to, for COVID-19 uh, control programs and sharing the knowledge and experience. So focusing on today's uh, meeting, uh, it is in collaboration with College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists in Sri Lanka. And uh, very interesting topics. Uh, all the lecturers are here and uh, some of the representatives from the Sri Lanka College of uh, Obstetricians and Gynecologists. I like to welcome all of you on behalf of the uh, Sri Lankan Medical Association. Without wasting much time, moving to the first uh, topic, case presentation. It will be done by Dr. Sajid Kodituakko, consultant obstetrician and gynecologist. He's from Base Hospital, Medrigiri. So we hope to uh, discuss all these uh, case issues. Uh, the, any, if there are any questions, we hope to discuss these things at the end of the uh, Thank you. Thank you. And uh, delivery is uh, not something we can do or see uh, every day. Uh, here, one has been done maybe every couple of years, once in every couple of years. And uh, but the thing is, it's very unpredictable. You don't know when you need to do one and uh, save a life. So that's why we thought of uh, sharing our experience and discuss the technical details. Right, so uh, I'll just uh, give you some background information so that uh, you'll be able to get a better picture of the story. So this happened in uh, May this year in uh, my teaching hospital, Ravama. Uh, this particular patient is a 39-year-old uh, in her second pregnancy. She had a miscarriage before. Uh, she had her obstetric care uh, privately and uh, she saw an obstetrician for the first time at nine weeks. And there she was diagnosed to uh, have hypertension. So in pregnancy, in obstetrics, if uh, hypertension is diagnosed before 20 weeks, we call it chronic hypertension. And uh, after 20 weeks, we call it gestational hypertension. So um, she started on treatment. The basic assessment was done. Uh, it was normal at the time. And uh, she was managed as an outpatient. She had a few uh, subsequent visits at 14, 17, and 22 weeks, which were unremarkable. But at 32 weeks, uh, her blood pressure was again detected to be uh, high. It was not coming under control of drugs anymore. Uh, she was uh, asked to be admitted for further assessment. And this is uh, around the time of uh, single scandal in India. Uh, we got all that information um, from uh, an interview uh, with the husband after the incident. So, uh, so they thought uh, it's all right to uh, be home for a couple more weeks and come to the hospital. So uh, around 35 weeks, she had uh, got some investigations done um, during protein, during uh, the administration. She was preeclamptic at least um, since 35 weeks, but there was no obstetric review. Um, and uh, at 38 weeks in the morning, she presented to the emergency um, with shortness of breath uh, and uh, rupture of membranes. The blood pressure was uh, 220 over 130. She was severely preeclamptic, had uh, features of heart failure, and um, we thought it could be a flash on the due to severe hypertension. So that's where the excitement started. Uh, so I was um, just after my foreign training, spending some time there, um, and I was the SR call for the day. Uh, the junior age shark uh, got a call from the emergency saying that there's a patient with shortness of breath. We didn't know about the uh, hypertension, so um, I thought it was pulmonary illness. So uh, we quickly went into emergency, but um, uh, as soon as we went into the room, the patient uh, went into cardiorespiratory arrest. The emergency uh, medicine consultant and the whole team was there. Uh, they were managing the patient's head end and started the uh, CPR. Uh, we continued that for a couple of minutes. Uh, it didn't look like it's working, so uh, we got things uh, ready for uh, very modern cesarean delivery. So uh, it uh, sounds very smooth and easy, but uh, uh, the emergency uh, department, they had not experienced uh, very modern cesarean delivery before. We did not have the equipment, so I still remember we uh, had to open like six. Uh, surgical uh, packs uh, to find a scalpel handle. 
So anyway, uh, we proceeded with the phenomenal uh, cesarean section. We were able to get the baby out within five minutes. So um, just to make things clear, uh, we were just in our normal attire, no uh, scrubs, no prepping, no raping, uh, no transfers, uh, skin and transitions, uh, just to use the water process uh, on the baby's coat and uh, took the baby out. Uh, we left the passenger in situ. So then our um, hands were free, we took turns and uh, uh, helped the emergency team for uh, resuscitation. Uh, and a couple of minutes uh, down the line with CPR, uh, there was uh, a return to spontaneous circulation. Uh, then uh, we started uh, on some microbes and stabilized the patient and took the theater. So by the time we had the whole obstetric team present at the scene, um, again, moving this patient uh, to the theater at the time was uh, really uh, memorable because uh, we had an emergency theater in the medicine department, but it was not functioning. So we had to take her to obstetric theater. There's no uh, all way connecting the emergency department and obstetric uh, theater. So we were pushing the uh, patient on that gravel road uh, into the obstetric theater, uh, just in the middle of the visiting hour. So uh, in the operating theater, we just tried uh, suturing the uterus uh, the usual way. Uh, but uh, it didn't seem to work. The tone was not good. Uh, when the circulation established, she started to bleed, and uh, we spent a few minutes uh, making a decision uh, whether to do a hysterectomy and whether to deny the ligation. And uh, we thought, all of us thought it was the best option at the time, and we proceeded with that. Uh, she had um, massive blood loss and received some blood. Uh, she remained uh, desaturated uh, for the whole duration of the surgery. Uh, we do some medicines, she had respirated, she had uh, pulmonary edema. Uh, and uh, anyway, after the surgery, we uh, transferred her to the ICU for monitoring, and she had a second arrest on the same day at night, which again lasted for a couple of minutes. And uh, actually, for the first two days, we thought she was recovering because she came off minor drugs and there was uh, attempts of spontaneous breathing. Uh, but from day three on, she uh, Promising the deteriorated, she had cerebral edema, which was present on the second CT in the morning, and uh, we took all the inputs necessary to manage her, but um, unfortunately, the outcome was poor. Uh, anyway, she hung on to the machines for another maybe, uh, 10 12 days. Uh, slowly went into multi organ failure, deteriorated, and succumbed, um, and the post mortem revealed hypoxic organ injury. And the baby uh, weighed a whopping 4.9 kilos, uh, came out in pretty bad shape, but the emergency team and the midwives around, they were really good, they resuscitated the baby quite promptly. Uh, and the baby came out of special care on day three. So, uh, not the happiest of any, but at least uh, uh, the baby survived. So, uh, so it's a little heavy. Uh, so that's my story, and uh, this is like not the first time I'm telling this story. And whenever I get an opportunity, I uh, highlight, try and highlight the importance of obstetric skin prints. Uh, so Prompt is one of them. Uh, I said I was just after my foreign training, so uh, in Australia where I got trained. So if you have, if you need to practice as an obstetrician, you have to have uh, an obstetric skill print done, done within the last six months. So basically. Every six months, you have to do an obstetric skill trip. Uh, in the white one, I did a case scenario like this with the maternal collapse where we had to do a very modern system and delivery. So that was included. So, um, so if not for that, I would have never thought of doing one in the emergency department in this case as well. So, that is just to highlight the importance of uh, doing regular obstetric skill trips and including even rare cases like this. Uh, into those uh, practice trails. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sandeep. Uh, so uh, we'll move to the next speaker. We'll come back to you again for question session. So I will invite uh, Dr. Sanjeev Padmadasan, who is a senior lecturer at the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Columbia. He will do the lecture on a very interesting topic. Very modern Caesarean delivery.
Good afternoon. Uh, in fact, the most dramatic of the interventions in the case that Sunny presented was the very modern society delivery. And I would like to draw your attention to this picture. This shows a woman uh, having had the abdomen open and the baby delivered. And this man holding a knife, right? This is actually, this depicts what happened in centuries ago, six, seven centuries ago in Rome. And this baby seems to be alive at the time of delivery, but the mother is dying or uh, just recently died, right? So this was, in fact, because of this law, which stated, the law of Caesar, it stated that the fetus, the baby, had to be separated from the dying mother or a, mo or a mother who has just who had died just now, before the period. And this, in fact, was the birth of the most widely performed surgery in obstetrics today, the cesarean section. A lot of people think that the term cesarean came because, because, uh, because Julius Caesar was born by cesarean section. It is actually not so. It is of this law of Caesar that is the way to the, uh, to the name of cesarean section. Well, if you see this, this is probably unusual because the baby would have rarely survived because usually the baby also would have died of the hypoxic insult. But today, the focus has dramatically changed. Today, the perimortem cesarean delivery is performed mainly to aid the resuscitation of the woman. And it also improves the chances of fetal survival because the fetal, the baby's survival lies on the survival of the woman, or else successful resuscitation of the woman. So the perimortem cesarean delivery is performed irrespective of whether the fetus is alive or not at gestations over 20 weeks because this gravid uterus would press on the inferior vena cava, impede the venous return, and affect the cardiac output, as well as this gravity uterus would press on the uh, press the press on the diaphragm and reduce the functional response capacity of the lungs. And this 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 figure of course shows this gentleman applying. The manual uh, performing the manual displacement of the uterus to the left, but if this was not used, the the, the mother would have been would have to be uh, tilted about 15 to 30 degrees to the left, and that would invariably affect the uh, effectiveness of the chest compressions. So the perimortem cesarean delivery is done because by removing the effect of the illness uterus that improves the chances of maternal survival, successful resuscitation. Well, it is recommended that perimortem cesarean delivery is commenced four minutes into the maternal cardiac respiratory arrest so that by the end of five minutes, we would have completed the surgery. Because after five minutes, it is likely that the brain would suffer a hypoxic insult and lead to permanent neurological injury or death. But maternal resuscitation is more challenging than resuscitation of a non-pregnant person because of the hemor because of the physiological changes that occur during the pregnancy. For example, the uterus, the uh, reduce venous return, 
reduced cardiac output, reduced functional receptor capacity, and the increased metabolic demands of the pregnant woman. And the fetus may already be compromised because the hypoxia, because the uh, because whatever because whatever had led to the cardiorespiratory arrest would have affected the fetus as well. And although, at the, although in the case that we discussed just now, the time of arrest was determinable, in most of the cases, it may be difficult to determine the actual time of arrest. And, and as mentioned earlier, delivery within one minute would not have been achievable in most of the cases. Therefore, recent research has, has shown that delivery much earlier than four minutes would have uh, would lead to a better outcome in both the woman and the fetus. Well, we don't require much equipment. All we need are just a few gauze towers, some antiseptic solution. And scalpel. And this would be all that is necessary to be included in a perimortem cesarean delivery. Right? So then, as mentioned earlier, we don't have to open a lot of packets or run here and there looking for various equipment. And this, this pack should be kept in all the places where you expect maternal car respiratory arrest. It could be the labor ward, it could be the antenatal ward. In the theater, of course, these are widely available. Maybe the accidental emergency, even the outpatient department. And we don't need, need much, just a very few items, but this is all we need. Well, talking about the technique, no time should be wasted by transferring the patient to the theater. The perimortem cesarean delivery should be done at the site of arrest. And no time again should be wasted by determining whether the fetus is alive or not, by listening to the fetal heart sounds or uh, connecting them to a CTG monitor. Because as I mentioned earlier, perimortem cesarean delivery is done mainly to resuscitate, mainly to aid resuscitation of the woman. And the aim is to remove the physical barrier to resuscitation, that is the enlarged uterus. So irrespective of the fetus, irrespective of whether the fetus is alive or not, this is recommended. And the patient is already in cardiovascular arrest, so there is no need for analgesia, no need for anesthesia. And traditionally, this perimortem cesarean delivery is done using midline incisions, both on the skin and the uterus. But today, the majority are unfamiliar with midline incisions. And, uh, and fit delivery can be achieved even with a superfluid transverse incision on the skin and a transverse incision on the uterus. So today it is recommended that perimortem cesarean delivery is performed using the technique that one is mostly familiar with. And the patient is in cardiovascular arrest, there's no blood loss. And the cord should be clamped, or if cord clamps are not available, manually compressed. I mean, the cord from the side of the neonate until the cord is clamped later. And the baby is added over to the neonatal team for resuscitation. So, and it is very important that the resuscitation, the other measures like chest compressions, intubation, ox or oxygen. The other resuscitative measures are carried out simultaneously. Right? And once, once the patient recovers, there will be a return of spontaneous circulation. And that is when the patient may start breathing. So actually, that is a good sign. That means, that means the, the patient is recovering. So at that moment, the patient is transferred to the theater, and the incisions are sutured and anesthesia and broad spectrum antibiotics are given. Well, if the bleeding is severe, which is unlikely, of course, temporary measures such as aortic compression can be used to control the bleeding until, uh, until the uterine incisions are sutured.
what was the place of perimortem district? In our case, of course, we had to perform perimortem district because the conservative measures did not control the PDP. But in all the all cases of cardiovascular risk, hysterectomy is not necessary. Hysterectomy is performed only only if there is uncontrollable bleeding, right? Uncontrollable, controllable by conservative measures, and if the bleeding has led to the risk of the cardiovascular risk. And this surgery would not only aid in resuscitation of the woman, but also prevent further bad loss. This was actually this specimen was this uterus was removed, uh, uh, not in the case of a pedimor, uh, uh, cardiovascular risk, but in the case of collapse, a patient with placenta acuta spectrum disorder who collapsed in the ward. I think she was about 26, 28 weeks, and this was the life saving operation. What about the place of? Instrumental vaginal delivery. Well, I told you the aim of perimortem cesarean delivery is to remove the physical barrier of the enlarged uterus. That is to relieve the uterus of the fetus. And if an instrumental vaginal delivery is feasible, for example, if the service is redilated, if the presenting part has engaged, probably a late stage of labor, instead of the perimortem cesarean delivery, Instrumental by Jandilly, which is quicker, uh, easier, and technically more feasible, can be performed. What about the future? Now, as I mentioned earlier, probably, although at the time being, what is recommended is to commence perimortem cesarean delivery four minutes into the cardiovascular rest. In the future, we might. Uh, we might come across recommendations which suggest immediate perimortem cesarean delivery uh, uh, at the time of the rest. And as I told earlier, the, the aim of this surgery is to aid resuscitation of the womb. So there are suggestions to replace the term perimortem cesarean delivery by a resuscitative hysterectomy. So probably in the next few years, we might see these changes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sanjeeva, uh, for that uh, interesting lecture. And uh, so as he said, uh, it's just to uh, perimortem cesarean section is done to aid uh, resuscitation process and increase the chances of survival of the newborn. So we are moving to the third one, third segment of today's uh, uh, collaborative meeting. Uh, it will be done by Dr. Milan Rodrigo, who is a senior lecturer at the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Faculty of Medicine, Kotlava Defense University. And Milan is my classmate also from the Faculty of Medicine, Colombo. Uh, he will talk about peripartum collapse. Thank you, Milan. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Zoranta, for the introduction. So, after the very interesting talks, okay, you are coming to the boring stuff. It is, it is a lecture. So, I will make it as much as interesting, right? Okay, hope you will enjoy. So, peripartum collapse, right? Okay, we all come across in our lives peripartum collapse. So, what I am going to do is how to identify a woman who is at risk of peripartum collapse, right? So to go through the different causes of peripartum collapse and delineate the immediate and ongoing management of the peripartum collapse. 
So to come across with the definition, so it is an acute event, right? Involving the cardiorespiratory system and the brain, resulting in reduced or abscess conscious level, potentially a death. So, right, so it is a rare event, possibly, but perhaps it is not because we are coming across around 100 maternal death at least a year in Sri Lanka. So one in three days, India in our country, mother is dying. So majority of them will collapse before that. So it is not so uncommon. So fortunately, there are some women who collapse will be revived. And those are the untold stories. And I will come to that in a bit. So the we know Miao's chart, so modified early obstructive warning chart, whether it is capable of predicting or identifying when woman who is going to collapse. Perhaps, yes, but it is a recommendation that we must use and we will identify. But in pregnancy, even though Miao's chart tell you that woman is well, if you think that a woman is unwell, that is the key thing. So, Take home message is your clinical acumen should not be replaced with the abstract. The thing is, physiological changes happening during pregnancy, it will make you to, it will, it will not give you the correct impression on the abstract. So it can be identified, but it is difficult. Your clinical acumen should come first before the MIAV chart. No excuse, still that we should use the MIAV chart. So causes, causes of maternal collapse, if you take a systematic approach, right, so they head to toe, right, like the case, first, first case, it is in the brain, could be, right, okay, hypoxia due to various causes. It can be a postpartum hemorrhage, it can be preeclampsia, it can be a ruptured of aortic uh, aneurysm, it could be a pulmonary embolism, it could be a sepsis. So there are various causes that can cause maternal collapse. But the key message is, now we, when we are confronted with a collapsed mother, we don't think of a very rare cause. We will think of a common reversible cause and get on with the, the resuscitation. That is the take home message we should if i were to go through a one through the courses briefly so hemorrhage is the commonest course but we all know that we miss major hemorrhage thinking that is a minor hemorrhage because so we the woman is all right suddenly she collapsed because we fail to understand the so slow peak. And when we talk about postpartum hemorrhage, we all picture idea, forgive me if I'm wrong, woman who is delivered after a normal delivery, but it is not the case. So cesarean section, uterine rupture, these are the instances where you will come across very severe postpartum hemorrhages where you could not be able to bail out the woman, right? But fortunately, woman is woman nine, theater women, you are doing a cesarean section. So thromboembolism. Now we think it is rare in our country. And we think thromboembolism, when, when we think of it, it is in the lung pulmonary embolism. But if I were to go through the in statistics in UK, right? So there are 50-50 pulmonary embolism as well as uh, cerebral, cerebral thrombo. So you have to always consider a woman who is complaining of a severe headache, suddenly collapse, it might be due to cerebral thrombosis. The cardiac causes, the another case, cause, and now we all thinking of the old teaching, I don't know about the younger ones, about the congenital heart disease or acquired heart disease like uh, rheumatic disease. Now it is becoming rare. Right? Okay. Now the causes are shifting to myocardial infarction, aortic, aortic dissection, and cardiomyopathies. 
Now the golden feature, if we were come across such a maternal collapse or death, when we go through this the, the, the history, so we will find out. So we have not taken new onset murmur or a new onset of wheezing. Wheezing first time in pregnancy always pathological. It can't be wheezing unless proven otherwise. So in these instances, we need to do a cardiology report. So the, card, the, the cardiologist should see, now there could be a controversy in here, who sh we should refer to a physician or the cardiologist. Whoever, this must be done in prompt and proper manner. Sepsis. It is ailed old thing, right? And we miss it, right? Okay. Why? Bacteria, which just cause bacteria in the blood, no fever, Normal white cell counts, right? It can rapidly progress into the shock, especially of the immunocompromised mother. And most of the time, positive organisms are strep group. Antidote of the look, uh, lignocaine, and where it is kept, whether your labor board has it. And of most of us, we don't know, the answer is don't know, at least for one question. Right, okay? And we don't know where it is kept. Right. So the local anesthetic toxicity, if you are encountered, first thing you have to do is stop the injection. And what are the signs or symptoms that going to tell you woman is developing local anesthetic toxicity. They might have twitching, circumoral uh, paresthesia, then they might have a fit and a, 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 a fit and they can collapse. Right, okay. Right. Eclampsia. So, most of the time, unless the case you have encountered, uh, it is known because patient must have preeclampsia, high blood, high blood pressure, and she must be known to the system, or somebody must have witnessed the patients having fit. So, making eclampsia diagnosis could be relatively easy. Right. So, intracranial hemorrhage, as I suggest. I told you earlier, so uh, complaining of a headache can be a feature. Who does not have a headache in pregnancy? Everybody does that. So it is a challenge that you need to identify troublesome headache from the normal sort of headache. So if the patient is having uncontrolled hypertension, particularly uncontrolled systolic hypertension, we often neglect putting it to patient was anxious or she got scared. So no patient is not scared or anxious until we prove a need, right? Okay, this is pathological. So, so what happened is ruptured aneurysm or arteriovenous malformation in the head can give rise to intracranial hemorrhages. Right. Anaphylaxis, right? Okay, so it is going to be sudden, we don't know. Right? So, if the anaphylaxis occurs and the following three cases, the pictures are present, mortality, mortality is more than 4%. That is, sudden onset and rapid progression of symptoms. The other thing is, life-threatening airway symptoms, breathing problem of circulatory collapse, and skin changes, mucus, mucosal congestion, flushing, urticaria, area, and energy. If these three things are present, there is associated increased mortality. Right. So when the maternal collapse occurs right, okay, in a pregnant mother, of course, so it is difficult to resuscitate a pregnant woman rather than a non-pregnant state. So one of is one of the reasons which, which we have discussed with earlier two percent. So the aortic compression, so as Sanjeeva elaborated, so. It is difficult due to reason seen. 
respirate with changes because of the diaphragmatic splinting. There is the, the uh, decreased functional residual capacity and the mother's tidal volume and the minute ventilation is increased during pregnancy. So for, for those reasons, right, uh, um, the respiratory system is resistant to resuscitation. So intubation is difficult by laryngeal edema during the pregnancy and weight gain. And when I go through the literature, the large breast, I was wondering how the large breast is interfering with intubation, intubation. Because the most intubation, intubation I have seen, they have they are performing from the other side, top of the breast, and the breast stars, breast star below the larynx. So it, it is it is because of the laryngoscope handle I was right? You won't be able to manipulate the laryngoscope handle and it will go and hit on the enlarged breast, right? There should be a special laryngoscope uh, to intubate the women with large breast. So that's the side. side piece. Aspiration. We all know why aspiration occurs. Reduce low esophageal uh, strength of pressure. Delayed gastric emptying and increase intraabdominal pressure due to gravity. Circulation, there's a problem. So blood loss is rapid compared to the non-pregnant state because of the increased cardio output and hyperdynamic circulation. So when we confronted the arrested woman who is bleeding or angry, problems are compounded. So, what are the optimal things? Optimal initial management of maternal health. Left lateral tip, 15 to 30 days. So, the ideal equipment is cardi, cardi patch. Or you can use anything. Saline bottle, cold towels, okay. Just anything helps to have a baby. So, you need to protect the RV as soon as possible with the cast endocratic tracheal tube to prevent the aspiration. So you have to give some complementary oxygen, high flow, right? If the high flow of oxygen is not available, right, if there's a machine not available, so back mass ventilation till intubation is done. So CPR, so circulation, CPR should commence immediately when you realize Airway is clear, but breathing is not happening. So compression ventilation ratio is 30 to 1 as per guidance today. Compression radius is 100 per minute. Ventilation is 10 per minute. So we, you need to insert two cannulas, 14 to 16 gauge, as soon as possible. So aggressive approach to volume refresh. You need to give one liter within 30 minutes. That is the aggressive arrangement till the other uh, the other fluids are cut. So you need to use the same uh, level of energy for the defibrillation and the same drug dosage. So they are these are the areas that a lot of people can get confused with whether the drug doses are same or different in a pregnant woman, whether the defibrillation is same or different in a pregnant. But, but the take home message is the, the, the dosages and levels are right. So, if there is a skilled operator, right, okay, to, to, to help with the concealed hemorrhage, that is the added advantage. Right. Ongoing management, right, okay, perimortem cesarean section, we have dealt with. But essential key feature is. You need, there is an experienced, trained, senior staff available. So that is the most predictable good outcome. So even if there is antipartum hemorrhage, cesarean section is recommended to deliver the baby, whether dead or alive, to stop the bleeding. IV tranexamic acid is useful of control. So massive pulmonary hemorrhage, inoxaparin IV, right? Amniotic fluid embolism, 
Right? It's okay. It is supportive that we can't do much about it. Right? Early senior staff include in, uh, in, in involvement, including obstetrician, anesthetist, hematologist, and intensivists. So these are the features going to make things better. Coagulopathy, early aggressive treatment with fresh protum, frozen plasma, and rotum, right? Okay, don't know whether it is quickly available or it takes time, right? So septic shock. If you are suspecting septic shock, so please follow Servine sepsis guideline six bundle of six, right? If the cardiac cases involved, so you need to involve the experts immediately after the session. Right. Local anesthetic toxicity, I have just told you, right? Okay, and intralipid 20% is antidote, right? We need to manage arrhythmias, that is, expert health is. So, clinical governance. Now, this is going to cause some sort of a audit, okay, complain, or whatever. So acute race, contemporary documentation is very important. As you highlight, right, okay, debriefing should be done once the things are very clear. Okay, it could be, okay, you debrief the family and the, the woman survives after the incident and there is a good practice. Okay, once they go home, when they return for the two weeks, review, review again, then it is better for them to go through the life and the next step. Right. So this is the little bit. Now Sri Lanka, way forward, it matters perhaps. Right. So do we know the incidents? No. Do we have a system of reporting? Yes and no. But what are the barriers? So barriers, I know there is a thing called near miss cases reporting in Sri Lanka, but it is not happening due to various reasons obvious to many of us. Right. So what are the barriers? Right. Ownership. Right. Okay. Who should collect the data? Right. Is it government, ministry, family health bureau, professional body, Sri Lanka Medical Association? Okay. But we know that okay, somebody should collect this data. So the other thing is the care, care providers are uh, fear of giving you, telling, reporting it is voluntarily unless it becomes statutory. Right? Fear of litigation, right? Okay. This week could also maternal collapse in front of sword. Next word, next time, next week also not to go forward, and they did that is bad mouth, right? That is the culture. The other culture, Sri Lanka, I, I, I will, I am witnessing, and I can't understand. There is a problem of getting the message in risk management meeting. So that is a, they, most of the people take it personally, right? But they don't. Think risk management is a closed door meeting. Once you have discussed there, yeah, right? Okay, we are friends. Okay, I can criticize management. Yes, but it's unfortunate it is your management. Right? But I am not criticizing you. Right? Okay. That message should be inculcated from the medical school through the postgraduate training. Right? Okay, that 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 is where I think. The problem lies in our, our setup with regard to these sort of a risk management meeting and the report. Right. So, so the, the good thing is the near miss cases, right? Okay, so this is the, you have a story to tell that is a good story, right? Okay, rather than a dead woman, you have a woman who is living, right? So that should be. We have, we should encourage those sort of cases to be discussed rather than the cases in bad outcome. So emergency teams, right, okay? So we are very poorly or ill prepared to deal with an emergency, right? Okay, simple thing as a bark park handler, 
right? Okay, is is very difficult to find when it is most needed, right? So the emergency treat teams like cardiac arrest team, transfusion team, major hemorrhagic team, and the transfer team. So you may understood how difficult it was patient to transfer from emergency room to the obstetric theater. It is a specialized job. So as we understood, now we have worked somewhere, somewhere else in the world, and from our work, we all understand these things day and night. But the problem is, right, okay, talk you about my language, it is like, so like, okay, when there's immediately half a month of a bad incident, we have a lot of good ideas to implement, but soon as it will be forgotten, right? So the other thing, the, 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 the need is mandatory training for essential skills like cardiopulmonary resuscitation and emergency objectives. Okay, it should be done and it should be incorporated into your career progress and it should be incorporated in your signing of your increment. Right? That is how it should go and it is going to not going to work if not such a rigorous method are managed. Right. Thank you very much. Any questions before I stop? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Nilan, for that uh, thought-provoking lecture. And one of the points I took is like, uh, can we learn from near misses and from these cases? And then that learn can be learning, uh, knowledge can be extrapolated into our practice. It's a very, uh, very important point you raised. We are moving to the final segment. Uh, it will be done by Dr. Nasita Hera. Senior Lecturer at the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Faculty of Medicine, University of Kerala. He will do some MCQs which will be useful for postgraduate trainees. Uh, thank you. Everybody. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to uh, do some MCQs in this session. Uh, we will get on to the things straight away. Okay, uh, the MCQs will basically be uh, focused on uh, perimortem cesarean section and uh, cardiac arrest in pregnancy. And uh, the source for this uh, information, the questions are made uh, from uh, the uh, article on. Uh, very modern cesarean section on uh, the obstetrician and gynecologist in uh, 2018 and uh, the Green Top Guideline. Let us start. Regarding uh, maternal cardiac arrest in pregnancy, the incident is approximately 1 in 20,000. The commonest cause is uh, amniotic fluid embolism. Following in hospital perimortem cesarean section, the survival rate of the baby is reported to be more than 50 percent. The risk of maternal hypoxic break injury is no different to that of non-pregnant states. I'll give you one minute for you all to think. Half a minute, maybe. We go on to the answer. Well, the incidence will be a little uh, lower. The commonest cause of uh, uh, commonest cause for maternal cardiac uh, arrest in pregnancy is actually the hemorrhage, which accounts for about forty-five percent of the cases. So, the cardiac disease, amniotic fluid embolism, comes next. Following an in hospital uh, perimortem cesarean section, the survival rates of the baby has been reported to be about 60 to 80 percent, as in our case we, we discussed. The baby has a better chance of surviving than the mom. 
So uh, the answer is true. It has have more than 50% of survival rate. The risk of uh, maternal hypoxic brain injury is no different to that in a woman who is non-pregnant. The answer is false. In the pregnancy, there's higher demand for oxygen. The baby is consuming. Gravity uterus will reduce the venous return, therefore reducing the cardiac output. So the, the risk of uh, maternal hypoxic brain injury is more or worse in uh, pregnant women than non-pregnant women. Move on to the second one. Regarding resuscitation in a maternal cardiac arrest. Yeah, regarding resuscitation in maternal cardiac arrest, left lateral tilt position is favored to manual displacement of the gravid uterus. Vascular access is best gained by sitting peripheral vascular cannula below the level of the diaphragm. A larger intertracheal tube should be considered because of the risk of intubation failure and expiration. When intertracheal intubation is secure, the chest compression should not pause for ventilation breaths. All right, we go on to the answers. Well, I think uh, one of our speakers uh, described this. Uh, left lateral tilt position is favored to manual displacement of the gravid uterus. Well, uh, manual displacement is supposed to be better in, you know, if you read literature, there will be evidence to say the manual displacement would be better. Uh, I think the argument they have explained is uh, in a lateral tilt position, your compression might not be as effective as the body in a tilted position, but it is open for discussion, it could be discussed. In, uh, the second one, the vascular axis is best gained by citing a peripheral vascular cannula below the level of the diaphragm. The answer is wrong, obviously, because uh, the venous return will affect the resuscitation process. The gravid uterus will have an effect on venous return. Therefore, always uh, in citing a cannula, it should be better if you could do it above the diaphragm. Third one, a larger intertracheal tube should be considered because of the risk of uh, intubation failure. That is false. Because uh, in case of an arrest, uh, because the pregnancy itself, the larynx would be swollen. It would be difficult to extend a larger, uh, larger intertracheal tube. It would be easier to use a small intertracheal tube and to cough it to uh, prevent aspiration. When endotracheal intubation is secure, chest compression should not pause for ventilation breaths. Yes, it should not pause for ventilation breaths. If you have a, if you have a, if you have intubated a woman, a pregnant woman in the resuscitation process, there would be hundred uh, cardiac massages to ten ventilator breaths per minute, and there would not be pausing for ventilation. Regarding a perimortem cesarean section, it should only be attempted if the uterus is large enough to suggest a fetal maturity. It should be considered if there is no return of spontaneous circulation after four minutes of effective cardiopulmonary resuscitation. It should be attempted as long as resuscitative efforts are being made. A consultant decision is required before proceeding to perimortem cesarean section. Well, I think our answers to most of this uh, has been discussed already. Go to the answers. It should only be attempted if the uterus is large enough to suggest fetal maturity. The answer is wrong. It's uh, said that uh, if the fetus is more than 20 weeks in size, it would have effect on resuscitation. It would have effect on uh, venous return. Therefore, to uh, proceed with the uh, perimortem hysterotomy or the cesarean section. 
there would not be any time for assisting a preterm children with that sound scans or going through notes in detail. So it will be clinical assessment of the funders, clinical judgment by clinical examination to uh, see the baby's size is more than 20 weeks. The second one, it should be considered if there's no return of spontaneous circulation after four minutes of effective CPR. Yes, the answer is correct. As uh, Sanjay has already explained, we would be deciding on uh, perimortem cesarean after four minutes and we'll be trying to deliver the baby within five minutes. It should be attempted as long as the resuscitation effort are being made. Yes, it should be attempted as long as the resuscitation efforts are being made. Yes. Yeah, it is safe. It should be a. It's a it is important. It's all the thing is to actually the, to be resuscitation of the mother. A consultant decision uh, is required for uh, proceeding to a perimortem cesarean section. No, it is an emergency situation. The attending uh, doctor who is capable of working on cesarean section would uh, go ahead with the delivery. Regarding a perimortem cesarean procedure, few more things. A pregnant woman who has a cardiac arrest should be urgently moved to obstetric theatre before performing a perimortem cesarean section. The optimum approach requires a low transverse skin incision. Initial bleeding will be minimal. The placenta should be removed immediately after the fetus is delivered. Yeah, most of these things has already been discussed. Yes, we'll go to the answers. A pregnant woman who has cardiac arrest should be urgently moved to obstetric theater. The answer is wrong. It should be done at the place where it happened. The optimum approach requires a low transverse skin incision. Well, uh, as Sanjay said, uh, there, there's arguments for and against that. Subambulical midline vertical incision would be quicker, and of course, it would uh, give a uh, uh, intra abdominal CPR, it would help. But uh, on the other hand, the person who is very familiar with the doing performing percent financial incision would be quicker in delivering that. So, could be discussed as that. Initial bleeding will be minimal, yes. True. The placenta should be removed immediately after the fetus is delivered. No, it would lead to bleeding. And if the woman revives, it would be uh, possible to separate it and complete the surgery in the operating theater. All right, after unsuccessful resuscitation of a woman during perimortem cesarean section, a decision to stop CPR should be made by consultant obstetrician. Intravenous access ports and intubation equipment should not be removed. Any uterine and abdominal incision should be closed. Formal debriefing, which may involve family, is recommended. Yeah. All right. The decision to stop CPR should be made by the whole team, actually. It will include the anesthetist uh, and obstetric team together, which is as intensive as the uh, emergency medicine team. Uh, it's a collaborative decision that uh, we are going to stop resuscitating. Intravenous access ports and intubation equipment should not be removed. Actually, it will help in the post-mortem examination process. They should be kept in place when we are sending the body off after failed uh, resuscitation attempt. Any uterine and abdominal incision should be closed. No, it should not be. It could be uh, unethical sometimes, not unethical, I would say. It would not be nice if a woman had to be sent to uh, the mortuary with the open tummy, so we may have to close the abdominal wall, but not uh, each uh, each layer. It, yeah, given up the resuscitation process. A formal debriefing is uh, recommended. Okay, a little bit of physiology. Which of the following physiological changes will affect the resuscitation process in pregnancy? Uterine blood flow is 10% of cardiac output 
a term predisposing to PDH. Plus volume increased by 50% causing increased oxygen carrying capacity. Heart rate increases by about 15 beats per minute, increasing circulatory demand. Reduced venous return due to rapid uterus increases uh, CPR demand. Systemic vascular resistance decreases sequestering blood during CPR. Okay, go on to the answers. Uterine blood flow, 10% of our cardiac output would go to the uterus, so it predisposes the woman to be BHS. Blood volume increased by 50%, but as hemodilution, the oxygen carrying capacity would not increase. Actually. The heart rate will increase, so increasing our circulatory demand. The venous return of the gravid uterus will reduce the venous return, so therefore there's increased the demand for PCR, I'm oh, sorry, CPR. Systemic vascular resistance decreases the bleeding sequestration of blood during a PCR, so increasing its demand. So there are a few uh, physiological changes. Uh, and change is just from weight of guidelines, actually. It says that uh, the different uh, physiological change and uh, effect of that on uh, resuscitation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rashika. Uh, we have uh, come to the end of the uh, session, and uh, we have. Do we have any uh, questions from? Uh, we have webcasted that through the Facebook. Also, uh, we give the links to the uh, general audience. Do we have any questions? Yeah. No. Uh, so we do not have any questions. And uh, one small question, like uh, did, uh, or if you look at the last few years, uh, like what is the chances of surviving of one of these mothers? Do you have like idea about in Sri Lanka situation? So we know the if I'm right, uh, the medically if there's a cardiac arrest, as a mortality is around seventy percent. Uh, cardiac arrest, uh, uh, mortality. So the we are the our. Uh, pregnancy resuscitation lies uh, if they come close into heart again. Yeah. So, more, as you as somebody said, uh, most of our uh, mothers are uh, mothers more than 99 percent deliver at the institutions, recognized institutions. So, uh, cesarean section, cardiac arrest during the peripartum period, uh, cesarean sections uh, is. Uh, so, uh, one, one request from uh, SLMA I think a motor time, these clinical meetings we have conducted. Now, uh, usually we see a bigger audience. Now we will cast it. I will see how many people have engaged it. We didn't see any, uh, we didn't get any questions. So uh, from discipline to discipline, it varies. But I know the lecturers have put a lot of efforts into this. So I, uh, I'm going to suggest for this year to develop a, uh, like a newsletter, compiling all the, because now only we are Every week we are having uh, these uh, clinical lecture meetings. So we we thought of I thought of discuss with the council to compile a like newsletter like thing where we can post it to all the members of the SLM because then that's a comprehensive thing. We have something in writing. So I uh, like to invite Dr. Sanjeev and Dr. Nigal Rodrigo to write a small article around thousand words to that uh, letter if we, if we can say make it a, i mean actually the, actually 
this newsletter ultimately will become a small booklet. But I, I think that is the way forward. I mean, I, 10, 10, 10 colleges are doing series of uh, lectures. So this is a huge commitment and uh, we have to maximize the outcome. So it would be great if you can write uh, around 1,000 words, uh, but below definitely 1,005. So we select uh, two lectures for you, motor and cesarean delivery and peripartum collapse. Uh, last week, we had a very interesting McNamara fallacy done by uh, College of Anesthesiologists. So uh, definitely, I put my efforts to compile an e-version as well as a small publication, maybe from a letter where we can disseminate it. With that thought, I'd like to thank uh, uh, College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists to organizing this, uh, uh, helping in this uh, clinical meeting, as well as the, uh, all the participants and the people who join us online. And not to forget our technical team and the uh, admin officers. Thank you very much.